I'd like to welcome everyone, good evening, um, to another edition of the Joy Chip Reading Project. In our book discussion tonight, I am always your host, James Edward Mills, and today I'm pleased to introduce this month's authors. We have actually two guests today, uh, David and um, Alyssa Q. And this evening, we're going to be talking about their book, Campfire Stories, Volume 2. Um, but before we get started, I want to make sure that um, we open up our discussion and um, acknowledge that I'm screening into you tonight, as I always do, from Madison, Wisconsin, which is the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people, a place called for time and memorial as Big Joe. And please, I want to always insist that wherever you are in North and South America, you take a moment to recognize the Native people who once called the place you now live home. I'd also like to thank the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for their support in this and other online discussions hosted by the Joycher Project, as well as the financial contributions of the Schleck Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society, the National Park Service, and um, also our, our partner Together Outdoors, um, who provide a small monetary compensation for us so that we can pay a modest stipend um, for our speakers every month. Remember, um, I think that it's important that friends should never let friends work for free. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Joy Chip Project, um, I'm a freelance journalist and independent media producer with a specialty in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the management of public land. And I am also an instructor at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, where I teach a course called Outdoors for All, um, which is an undergraduate seminar. And many of the books in, on the Joy Chip Reading Project are part of our reading list. Um, this is an opportunity for the general public, as well as non-students, to experience some of the important issues and relationships that people of color have with the natural world. Now, I'm very happy to introduce our guest first, um, Alyssa Q, who is a designer um, and um, a design researcher focused on inclusion at Fog Design, uh, Frog Design, a global creative consultancy and the founder of Amble, a sabbatical program for creative professionals to take time away with purpose in support of nature, um, uh, nature conservancies. And her husband, David, um, is a um, socially engaged artist and writer and also an administrator. Um, she was, he was born in Seoul, Korea and raised in the United States. He explores the creative tensions of identity, community, and public space in, in his work. Um, and they also live with their two daughters outside of Philadelphia and are always seeking adventures. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dave and Alyssa Q. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks for having us. Thanks, James. Yeah, and I, I, we were saying when we were um, getting set up that this is the first time that we've had an opportunity to connect um, since you were doing research on your first book, Campfire Stories, Volume 1, and you were making your way across the country on a major national park tour. You made a stop in Madison, Wisconsin. We had a, a chance to meet. Uh, Alyssa, at the time, you were pregnant with your first child, so um, I was shocked to discover that she's six years old now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it sounds like like you haven't let any grass grow under your feet in the time since your last book. Um, first of all, what can you tell us about what has happened or what has changed since the creation of your first book, Campfire Stories, Volume 1? In our in our lives or with the the volume two book? <laughs> Both. I mean, because I would like to think that one leads into the next. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, last time we we spoke, we were working on volume one. Um, we pulled that um together following the research trip and in, in the the year that followed. Um, we're not totally sure how people would respond to it, but it uh kind of blew us away, like how much the book, the concept of the book resonated with folks. Um, we've been very fortunate that um, people are picking it up, they're finding joy in it. Um, and that was enough for us to think about a volume two. Um, we were starting to get into this uh, before everyone joined, but um, the pandemic really played a role in helping us see a possibility of volume two as you know you mentioned before i was 
pregnant um, when we were working on volume one, not planned, not expected. We found out three weeks into the trip that we had a little stowaway with us. Um, and once we had her, we a, a couple years later, we had our second daughter, um, who's now three. We just couldn't really see a, a possibility of us hitting the road again for six months to do the what we thought was the proper research or the proper process um, that we did the first time around. Um, but when the pandemic hit, I think as everyone else did, we um, were pretty much dreaming of anywhere else other than our house. Uh, we had been cooped up for many months. We were thinking about you know places that we would rather be and travel to, and we started to to see all this um, you know these videos from within the parks. Whether we knew people who. Um, you know, were in them because they they worked nearby, or there were you know things going viral social on social media, like coyotes and bears walking through parking lots, and it just was like, huh, there are more stories to tell about these national parks, and I think um, what we started to realize, um, and we coined or we didn't coin this term, but one of our authors is that our lives became um, one big Zoom meeting basically. And we we started to realize like people are very accessible right now and we know they're home and we know they're, <laughs> um, you know, they're available. And we started to recognize that like, maybe we didn't need to do the travel necessarily to work on the second volume of the book. Um, and we started to think about, um, you know, when we finished, when we wrapped up the first book, there were things that it, we, we thought, like, if we would do this again, we would do it a little bit differently this way. And I think um, the pandemic, uh, and I'll pause in a second, I swear, um, really enabled us to explore those changes and made it possible for us to, to do it in a different way. Volume two. Well, and I think that many of the ways that this new volume is different is that you are featuring many new voices mm -hmm. you know, from a, an, an even broader cross-section of the writing community. And also, I think that you're, you really leaned into aspects of diversity. I'd be very curious to know what your process was in terms of being able to, to find the authors that you uh, in many ways, you commissioned original work for this mm -hmm. piece. And I just think that it's wonderful that you're able to bring in so many different voices. How did you go about doing that? Maybe I'll address the diversity thing if you want to talk about after the process, more specific process piece. I think with diversity, like one thing I just want to add is when we worked on volume one, we were really reliant on those libraries and archives and in places where we're like, oh, these are where we're going to find our stories. Um, but what we found was that at some point in time, someone had to decide that something was worth saving and um, preserving to tell the story about place. And so while always from the get-go, even in vol volume one, it was always our intention to highlight diverse voices and share diverse stories, they were not super easy for us to find in the places that we were looking. Um, so that's one of the things that when we said, if we ever do a volume two, we would do things differently so that we could have those diverse perspectives in the room. Um, so Dave can talk a little bit more about our process for, for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It def so it definitely comes out of a critique of our own process and kind of like looking back at the collection and being like, huh, you know, there's, there's a certain type of author, a certain type of narrative that really gets prized here. And, you know, we did everything we could to you know, look look for alternative stories and, and storytellers. Uh, but this time, I think we got a chance to really, like you said, um, instead of instead of us going to the place and, and scouring all the collections, we got to put out an invitation. We we uh, uh, um, unleashed a call for submissions, and we invited people to do to apply in one of three categories. One, you could either send us um, a, a piece that you had written already that is one about one of the six parks that we were writing about this time Two, you could um the second option was you could send us a, a group of writing samples uh and, and we would then commission a new story about one of these places but you had to have prior experience already you know don't write about somewhere you don't know 
Um, and the third one was um, we, I guess through we, you know, we we did a Kickstarter. Um, we we went back to Kickstarter to raise funds, and that was really important because we wanted to provide travel grants. You know, one of the big barriers to the, these um, pristine national parks is that it, it you need the privilege um, to to be able to take the time off to go there. You need the funds. You need the vehicle. You need the transportation to get to these places, which are often pretty far away. Um, so we wanted to give that opportunity to people who might not have it inherently. Um, to writers who we you know we could see could write but might not have been able to take the time to go and experience these places so i think um the the fundraising was really important in being able to offer those travel grants to writers uh, and i think and i think you know this that we we had um that whole submissions process well, and, and in the meantime you know we were stuck at home and every every night after the kids went to bed we would spend a couple hours just scouring <laughs> scouring um all, all all the corners of live of virtual libraries of the internet looking for looking for this type of writing to help fill in you know ultimately what is um the anthology of six stories about six stories per park um give or take that would give you this sense of what each place is like see and i think that's what is really remarkable about this anthology in that you are very deliberate and explicit about finding new voices to tell new stories. Yeah. Because as Alyssa, you just alluded to and Dave, you just said, there is a lot of privilege that is built into the very notion mm -hmm. of spending time in the outdoors. I mean, it requires disposable income. It requires leisure time, you know, and it's not just the desire to go outside and being able to create those opportunities in and of itself is pretty groundbreaking with regard to the types of stories that you're able to tell. Um, once you were able to, to kind of define your reach in terms of your overall group of potential writers, how was the writing process just in terms of being able to encourage, cajole, <laughs> inspire right because I trust me I know how hard it is to write to deadline and so forth what was the process in terms of managing so many writers at one time I mean there's 50 different authors in this book yeah it was definitely a different experience this time around working with so many more living writers um and I think Dave um we were talking about reflecting on this recently and said, like, we actually really had to play more of that editor role than we had to prior. So beyond just like curating stories that we enjoyed, that we thought fit the book that hit on the themes we hoped it would to capture a sense of place, we had to do a lot more like coaching and editing and grooming of the stories. Um, so I don't know, do you want to give a specific example? We were kind of reflecting on one of our, our writers, which was like a real like learning moment um, for us and for everyone involved. Yeah, I mean, um, in volume one, you know, we were often working with, um, you know, pardon, pardon, pardon my bluntness here with dead writers, you know, with historical texts, uh, uh, some texts that are in the public domain. And it was like, we could we could we could we could take out our scalpel we could cut it however we wanted we could arrange it and we could kind of like make it really fit our narrative with this uh th this kind of editing was we you know our, our background is in writing we don't have english degrees um so we had to be we had to do a lot of learning about how to uh take a piece of creative work and give feedback and go back and forth and then also you know there are some uh, th there's definitely some processes um, where we gave some feedback about like, we don't, we kind of don't get this. Could you add some of these details in? And the writer wrote back and defended their work. And we're like, actually, you know what? We see it. <laughs> we see it. And we're going to challenge our ad audience as well. And there is one particular instance where um, I hope I'm not calling her out, but calling her in to how, how impressed we were at her process with um, Lace Lawrence had, we had commissioned a piece and we just weren't getting the vibe. You know, there's just some, uh, some disconnect between like what we felt was a campfire story and what was being submitted, but also because we were green, we didn't quite know how to give that feedback in a way that, um, 
that that would get you know that would kind of bridge that gap we didn't we couldn't verbalize it either so i think ultimately we were like you know i'm sorry but this just isn't working and we're going to move forward without without your piece and she called us in right away to say like hey no no i'm really excited about this collection i want to be a part of it and i can i know i can do different styles of writing so we really worked together and had long conversations about like you know, you know what is what is what is the disconnect? What can we maybe? What's another topic? And especially for us, another uh, another complexity is that we want these six stories to kind of link together, right? We're we're really we're not just picking six random stories that we thought were fun and, and throwing them together, but we're we're trying to say like, okay, this park has these features, and we want them expressed. You know, one piece of them expressed through through each of the stories. We want you. We want the reader to get a little closer to that understanding of like, wow, this is this is this place. Um, so you know, we're we're going back and forth with Lace about like, okay, this is this other you know, stylistic things we aren't feeling. These are the details of this park that haven't been expressed yet through the other pieces we're finding. You know, could you could you start to write towards these things? And to her credit, um, she really helped helped us see and, and ended up writing something that was really dynamic uh, and really powerful, uh, despite having editors that had no clue what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, and something that was like more like authentic and personal to her, which I mm. feel like just it really it it landed really well. Um, I think one of the um, aspects of the initial piece was that it made for a really great campfire story, like it checked those boxes. But I think at the end, we were like, it just isn't um, giving that sense of place, which is a really important part yeah. of all the stories that we select. And like, we want to be respectful of people's time as well, um, where we pay all our writers, um, but we also recognize writers never get paid enough. And so there's only so many times you can go back and forth with edits before you feel like you're asking too much. Um, so we learned a lot just as editors. Um, to instead of just giving up on the piece and saying it's hopeless um, to kind of to give people that second chance because I don't think we recognize either like what an opportunity and exciting thing it is for them uh, as well to be a part of the collection and I think that's something that just continues to take us by surprise now that a lot of the writers are receiving their copies of their book like we're seeing all these amazing Instagram stories of people holding the book and like just so like amazed they're in a published book with like Cheryl Strayed and Raina Priest and Terry Tempest Williams and all these like big names um so that's been like an interesting uh experience with volume two is just being able to see the impact on writers who um maybe haven't been able to make it in print um quite yet Right, and and not just in print, in in a, in a hard covered book, you know. I mean, in that for a lot of first time writers is a really big deal, you know. When you think about what it takes just to break into publishing in general, mm -hmm. I mean, what you've successfully done is created a beautiful model, especially in this space that has had so many gatekeepers mm -hmm. for so long. And so much of the narrative is being defined and described by a very particular part of our culture and our society. And that literally opens those gates wide to give first time writers a, a really good opportunity to see their work in print and, and add to the overall narrative. Because, you know, this is where we start really celebrating the national parks because they are now indeed expressive of everyone's lived experience you know and I think I really like more than anything else the original conceit of the book of being able to tell the stories around a campfire to a live audience and and I really love in the um in the opening section right after the introduction you actually have a detailed series of storytelling tips you know and I think that this is really a good idea for anybody who is learning how to speak in public, but also in this particular genre of storytelling. I think that's fascinating. I'd love it if we could just go through the list and, and talk briefly about, you know, why it is that you made these particular su suggestions and, and how you've, you've kind of defined it. So the very first suggestion is choose the right story. So what is a good campfire story? 
Do you want to take it or you want me to take that one? Mm. This is always like a, a hot topic with our book. <laughs> you go for it. Yeah, I mean, um, when we think about campfire stories, like off the bat, people think spooky, ghost stories, suspense. Besides the fact that we are wimps, like we don't do scary stuff. Um, for us, we were more interested in learning about place, something that tells you more um, that only, you know, a, a, a bit of poetry or pro other perspective can kind of provide dimension um, to a place. Um, so I think that one important thing that we like to tell people off the bat is like, these are not the spooky, suspenseful ghost stories um, that you might imagine, um, but I think they'll give you a little bit more. Some of the pieces are too long to read out loud. You'll lose your audience. Um, some of them are for a quiet read around a campfire. I think that's sort of how we always envision from the get-go, like this book would be consumed around a campfire, maybe a metaphorical one, one in your backyard, when you're on a camping trip, when you're in the national park. Um, but it's okay if some of those are for yourself. The ones to read aloud, what makes a good campfire story, I think is something that um, one that you're really interested in, in terms of the topic, that you can kind of present it with gusto. Um, it's on the shorter end, maybe it's an excerpt. Um, maybe you're talking a little bit about what you learned from the piece and you're reading um, just one small part of it. Um, the, the poetry pieces are really great to read around the fire. They're shorter, they're snappier. You can grab um, pieces of them. Um, what do you think? Anything else you would add to that? And I think for us, what, what distinguishes our collection is that, yeah, we want, we want, we, we define a campfire story as something that communicates a truth, um, that tells you something factual or, um, or just kind of emotional about the place that you're in. Um, so, so for us, yeah, for, for us, it, it's really about when you, when you read it aloud, it's about like, I guess you don't have to read it right off the page. Uh, we've been told over and over that there's a big difference between the written word and the spoken word. Um, so, so something you can, you can either just read it off the page if that feels right for you, or you can just communicate the nuts and bolts of the story. Story, you know, we, we have been passing down oral traditions uh, and those don't have to be um, the same every time. In fact, they're usually better if they are, are, are changed slightly in each, each telling of it. Um, yeah. And I will say I am extremely introverted. I am not the person getting up at the campfire, um, reading very expressively. Um, but I feel like there's a safe space in this book for every type of person and personality. And I think that's done with intention. Um, and it and again, with the second volume, it's been really interesting having living writers. We've been able to do some events with people reading their own pieces and man it is so different hearing someone else read their own work than to to read it aloud ourselves or in our minds of how we think they might be reading it um it's really powerful mm -hmm. um so th there's something there too i yeah. my mind is always like how can we capture the way the the writer has actually intended it to be kind of spoken orally because surely they're thinking of that too, but TBD on that. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that really kind of helps the reader of this book to set themselves up for success mm -hmm. you know, as they are reading it aloud as you intended. You know, like I like the fact that you suggest that people read the book or the story out loud in advance. You know, and I think that there's something to be said for the rehearsal aspect of that. But also, you know, I and I like what you describe as um, set yourself up for a good reading. How do you do that? What What are the, the the ways in which you set yourself up for a good reading, whether it's around a campfire or if it's in front of an intimate audience like we have tonight? So um, a lot of the suggestions, if not most of them, we should note come from uh, Ben Camp, who is a uh, a friend, our realtor randomly, <laughs> and a um, uh, a, a theater 
a performer and producer um, who has a lot of experience with this. And it was funny having the initial conversation, kind of consulting with him on like how people can prepare for something like this. And I mean, it was things as basic as like having water uh, <laughs> nearby, which would be the classic rookie move that I would pull of being the nervous introvert, getting up in front of people and then like completely going dry. But it's really important um, when you're around a fire, you're already uh, dehydrated and then you're getting up in front of people. You need to have that to clear your voice. Um, there's a, a tip and trick here about like sitting up straight, um, speaking, sort of breathing from your, your diaphragm um, because you're also potentially competing with um, the sound of crickets if you are around a fire um, and the, the crackle of a fire. Um, so they're just intended to be things that might seem obvious for those who are performers or who do this public speaking for a living. Um, but for most people, they might not know some of those basic tips for um, getting prepared to, to get up in front of a group. Mm -hmm. you know, and I also like the, the suggestion of find the rhythm and then break it. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I think this is uh, this definitely comes from the mind of a theater producer, <laughs> someone someone who understands how to create dramatic tension, how to build towards something, how to you know how to, how to continue to draw people in, and then all of a sudden, find a moment to stop, so that whatever point you're making has incredible dramatic effect. And I loved that as a, something that um, I you know I wouldn't have known to do that. I wouldn't have known to try to plan for that. But in, certainly when we're writing a story there are a lot of these types of structures that are hidden in the, in the, in the text and the way that you read aloud and you kind of uh, express the story, you know, when, when someone is listening and receiving that story, they have nothing else to look at other than maybe a campfire, which is, you know, uh, throughout all of time, very hypnotic and a great thing to look at. But these details about how you set up the reading and the way that you kind of uh, enunciate and the rhythm that you have, I think these are all going to be parts of that experience. So that's a, uh, that's a kind of a theater trick that I was really excited to learn from Ben about, um, you know, uh, how, how how much tension that can create in, a, in the telling of a story. Yeah, and you also suggest that one should not overperform mm. or letting the performance get in the way. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Do you want to take it? Mm. He's more the performance artist, so I'm letting him have these <laughs> introvert here. <laughs> Why is not overperforming? I think um again, I think um I, I think that lack of authenticity will come across. Um if I were to you know you ask what's one the first one, the first suggestion here is to choose the right story. Um if I were to pick a story by the um, there's a, a Glukik legend. No, no, is it Glukik? Mm -hmm. There's a Glukik legend told by Harvest Moon, um, mm -hmm. a Quinault elder, and she tells it in a very specific way. Uh, and she's a wonderful storyteller. But if I were to I were to come up and try to perform it that exact same way, if I asked everybody to imagine me as a Quinault elder, I think you know, you'd roll your eyes hard and you you wouldn't, instead of listening to the content of the story, you would see me trying to mimic and, and take on a personality that is not mine. So I think it's important that you have that authenticity, that you do what feels comfortable, but that you're not, over, yeah, I think I that, that'll take away from the content of the story. Um, so I think there's an authenticity that you lose as soon as you try to, you know, take on, take on a personality that is not yours and really, you know, do, 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 you know, don't do too much. <laughs> but you'll, you'll, well, it comes across. Could not agree with you more. I've been in environments where people kind of get out over their skis mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to sharing a story in a way that is completely over the top. Yeah. And it's that lack of perhaps self-awareness mm -hmm. that prevents them from being substantively engaged with the audience. Yep. Because at, at a certain point, it becomes more about you than it's about the story. And that's where I think we have a tendency of losing people. Yeah. You know, and I think that um, especially as you put this wonderful anthology together, each of these stories has purpose. And and I love the fact that you've managed to contain the narratives around very specific national parks. 
-hmm. you know, and so that, you know, the stories kind of dovetail nicely with one another from one part of the country or one geographic region to the other, and you get multiple perspectives from them. Mm -hmm. And as much as I would love for us to read every single title that we have in your in your wonderful book, um, Alyssa, would you mind if you were to read um, one of the selections that we talked about a moment ago that would sure. your friends give Although I feel like I've built up Dave as the performer here. Do you want to take this one? No. 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 <laughs> you can see me squirm. <laughs> Um, so this, um, piece that we thought might be nice to share a little bit of, um, is, uh, by a writer, uh, Ruth Nolan, who we finally just got to meet in person. Um, we just, uh, came back, uh, from a little mini book tour, um, Grand Canyon Joshua Tree, which are two of the parks, uh, featured, uh, in this book. And, um, Ruth has been such a helpful uh, collaborator um, in helping us understand the context of Joshua Tree, um, you know, providing resources, connections to people. We would get emails, hey, have you thought of so-and-so? It's important to capture this. She was just a great collaborator, um, but her piece itself is really incredible. And it um, is something that she had created prior for a Kind of multimedia video installation, um, but she had she had um, reached out about uh, I think through our call for or no we we read one of her articles and we loved it um, and uh, she sent this piece as an example of her work and we I think we were thinking about creating something new but this I was like we well, can't possibly match or beat this piece because it just tells you. It's so illustrative. It tells you so much about the environment in Joshua Tree. All right, so Ruth Nolan. In Joshua Tree, in the land that crowns its needled glories with sand, in the desert made of pavement fallen from the Milky Way, in the desert made of deep holes carved by grinding stones, in the desert made of canyons cut through geologic zones, in the desert made of walking rain that eyes can far off see, in the desert made of fan tree palms. In the desert made of cold, in the desert made of blinding mirage, in the desert made of light so old it whispers like grooved bones, where the woolly mammoth and rattlesnake cross through time and home, oceans of time rising and receding, land quaking in their tidal paths, where the granite bathliths arch their backs, where the red-tailed hawks fault their hunting suns. O oh, desert night lizard, with your comet tail, sparking eternities of stars, with your rustling dance amongst Washingtonia Philifera fan palm families. This is where I should do my homework and prepare. You're invisible sipping at these faint green oases, with your instinct for scuttling sideways up sharp rock hills, with your narrow paths and native grasses, with your nest inside fallen Joshua trees, with your burrowed body penetrating sand dunes, with your zigzag shape. You whip your way into abandoned mines, old gut wounds of the world, the way it was, whole and undesert then. So I'll stop there. That's about a, ooh, not even like a third, like a fourth of it. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible piece. Um, Ruth Nolan. Oh, you're on mute, James. Just suddenly realized. Thank you. Um, I, I really, again, appreciate the, um, the pacing and the tone and the imagery, you know, that is associated with a piece like this, because it's actually very common of all the pieces in this collection. And, you know, when we stop and we think about the different myriad voices that are being presented from the same general position, you know, when it comes to why the national parks are so important to so many different types of people, I think that these are the things that we resonate with when it comes to these important important narratives. What do you hope people will experience as they read these stories that are clearly different from what they were raised on, that were clearly different from what is quote unquote traditional environmental storytelling? How will they, how will they hopefully see these stories as, as different from what they typically no. Hmm. 
I mean, I guess to my first reaction is that I think our hope, one of our goals and what has proven to be true is that we're attracting a new audience of people to environmental writing or outdoors writing. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we've thought too much about the folks who have been raised on this type of writing. Um, I think Dave once referenced, and I kind of like scoffed at it, but he said once, like, it's almost like the, the pop music of environmental writing. And I think, but what he meant was like, it's accessible. There are some pieces that challenge the reader. It, I mean, I hope it's never turned anyone off, but I think it mostly lures people in to want to know and learn more. And so I think when I think of the reader, I think of those who love the outdoors, probably go for hikes, love the national parks, but maybe are not the people who like pick up certain texts or the like uh, national park readers that have like really dense essays uh, about, you know, the history or the, the meaning of place. Um, so I think it's a, it's accessible and it invites like a new reader in. Um, mm -hmm. When we set out with the project, a big goal was to like um, ignite people's imagination about the wild and place. And I think that that just like speaks to like who we're trying to attract and to kind of lure in into this world. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything to that? I think I, I think we are the let's see. It's easy at this point in the history of national parks to think that the preservation of these places is automatic, right? I think the a lot of the writing we encounter is um, you know, uh there's a lot of art, paintings, uh, writing, um, testimony created when we were trying to preserve these places. There are a lot of people, it was a group of project, right? We all had to come together and justify to Congress that this place also needed to be preserved. Um, but we are a hundred years past that. Um, we are a generation that has always known national parks as an idea to exist. And we, you know, but if we assume that these places will always be protected, always be preserved, that there will always be political capital and political and budget set aside, uh, then I think this is something that we can lose. You know, there are, uh, as we can see in our political landscape, you know, there are a lot of um, standards, uh, a lot of systems that, that can go by the wayside a little more easily than we expected. So I think what's important is to make the parks idea relevant for a new generation and that was you know one of the things we talked about wanting to create emotional connections to these places not just as you know a place where you go and take an instagram picture but somewhere that is uh, worth saving somewhere that is, um, that emotionally you might have connected to these other people that have uh, and certainly some of the right much of the writing for us um i think as as east coasters right um we we were really slow to understand the desert and even uh, like the desert, we we were we were dry. Uh, we had arrived to the desert in a heat wave. It was very. Just... I was like, in my first trimester, very hot uh, on the inside and outside, and yeah. the outside was like 112 degrees. So it was it was a, a tough adjustment. So we we didn't understand why people liked that place, uh, but it was when we sat down with the writing that we started to understand the the poetic implications of it. The 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 meaning and the effect that it had on people um and, and all of a sudden we started to find pathways to appreciate the desert in a way that we hadn't and i think that connection is important not just for us to create but for other people to um to hold on to as we continue on in um the, in the next hundred years of this uh, national park project well more than anything else i really appreciate the fact that you are introducing the national parks to a brand new audience mm -hmm. and also and I, I really love what you just said about working past the presumption that the parks will be inviolate forever. Mm -hmm. It really does require people continuing to care, continuing to invest in their stewardship long term. And it's only going to be through this emerging generation that that's ultimately going to happen. 
I want to make sure that we make time for our, our questions from the audience. So please, if there's um, anyone who'd like to ask a question, please don't hesitate to either raise your hand. I'll invite you to turn your camera on and unmute your microphone. But also, please, if you'd like, you can write your questions in the in the chat function in the, in the in the right column of the screen. Um, as this whole project moves forward, I mean, I know that there's a lot going on with regard to just telling these really important stories. You know, I'm kind of curious, you know, it, were there any stories that you might have liked to have gotten in, but didn't or couldn't for whatever reason? And if so, what were some of those stories and what happens to them now? <laughs> We were having a tough time with this question because um, I guess we couldn't access our brains to kind of what we had left out, but I have. I think we just, we got so lucky, I think is the answer is like we, there was a lot of time spent looking for the right story. And I feel like we pretty much immediately knew ones that were just like, yeses, like, okay, go ahead. No, Sorry. no, 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 no. There's a hot hot discussion, a hot debate that we had, and we still haven't been able to include any type of climbing story what wait in this book in both books we have not included it and it's because I think we have a standard of like a story has to be uh, accessible and relatable and mm. anytime we come across a climbing story I think I guess this was especially true in Yosemite which has such a storied uh, uh that's the birthplace of you know contemporary climbing but the problem is when we read these climbing stories they just have so much technical information about mm. the certain paths and the certain there's there's just so much lingo that we just there's this barrier mm. um and i feel like it just never passes our standard of like yeah we can read this aloud and everyone can get it even though and i feel like we passed passed how about this one how about this one how about this one and it just never got over the hump so that i feel like that is a that is a, a gaping hole <laughs> there was one story that i really grieved saying goodbye to for now which i'm totally blanking on the title of it but it was um a story about crater lake um which i was trying really hard to squeeze into our pct and at chapter um because i could justify like the route uh towards crater lake it was just this really wonderful piece and um that was a challenging chapter because we combined two national scenic trails into one chapter. Um, so, you know, there's so little room for each chapter and then we're trying to represent two different places. And it just, the, the ultimate argument against it was that it wasn't specific enough to not only the trail, but the themes of what we heard about the community and the people that develop around through hiking or section hiking or enjoying these trails. So that's, it's, it's not something we've had to say completely goodbye to, but maybe in a future possible book, mm -hmm. you know, we could squeeze in Crater Lake as a, a park to focus on just to feature that amazing story. Well, truthfully, I mean, I, I never really thought about the inaccessibility of climbing relative to the type of storytelling that you had hoped to put together in this anthology. In fact, and if anyone is listening to this and would be inclined to imagine a more accessible climbing or mountaineering story, and, and truthfully, I, I almost like to figure out how to do something like that myself, because hmm. you know, the, I think one of the problems you know, with outdoor recreation in general is that we kind of do ourselves a disservice by um, either intentionally or unintentionally making it seem so epically inaccessible uh -huh. that we write people out of the experience mm -hmm. simply because, not just because of the danger, but because it is so utterly unrelatable to someone who's never had the experience of handling ropes or carabiners or Blade devices or any of the things that are necessary for a climber to be successful. And I think that that is where we sadly lose people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to figuring out how we can continue to make these 
opportunities more accessible to more types of people. Yeah. You know, and so as you're probably thinking about volume three, <laughs> um, what can you imagine the, the future of this particular type of storytelling be? And not just from the standpoint of the new types of stories, but the new storytellers that will be added to a future volume of camp sto campfire stories. Hmm. Still on that for a moment. Yeah, I mean, I feel like each volume we've kind of iterated on our process and our our approach, but we haven't. I don't know that we've we've totally reflected exactly yet on like the storyteller that we seek. Um, I think we have found like great gains in the new approach that we've taken for volume two in accessing a contemporary newer writer. But what we have lost um, in not doing the traveling is like our own compass, our own sense of place, not having been to all of the parks ourselves until recently we uh, hit a couple more. Um, but I think it just, it made us realize that that is an important component of creating the story um, to build those relationships and those connections and to um, to kind of have those spontaneous moments of meeting people who leads us to the next story or then the next sort of like important theme of a park. Um, so I'm not totally answering your question as far as like the storyteller themselves, but I think like there's there's maybe something to be found in uh, that question in a more like hybrid approach for a possible next time we work on the book of kind of landing in a place. We've now done this a couple of times. What else could we do with this medium and the story um, as we're meeting people in real life and e experiencing the place and who we can maybe seek out um, for the next volume? Well, I, I definitely look forward to what happens next. But the great thing about it is that I would imagine that it's ongoing, that you're getting the periodic new stories that you're probably putting on a shelf hoping to it, it actually just occurred to us that we don't need to do this book all in one go mm -hmm. like it has never occurred to us until recently we were like you know we could probably just do a park right you know over a few months and then build towards the next volume um I don't know why that has never occurred to us I think mainly because we had to take a big chunk out of our life to work on the first book and then the second one just kind of was a blur and happened during a pandemic sure. um two toddlers at home yeah That's a um, good idea james <laughs> let's, let's well, that note down well i mean and that's i think that's one of the great things about modern social media and the the culture in terms of having opportunities to tell short stories in a variety of different formats I can imagine you having your own magazine one day, you know, mm -hmm. where it's a, a periodical anthology, you know, where these stories are 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 published in a in a thoughtful and meaningful way. Mm -hmm. You know, hint hint to all the, the publishing organizations out there. I don't know that the Matineers books would be interested in getting in the magazine publishing business, but you know, this is something that is highly accessible in mediums like Substack. In, yeah. in in platforms like media or WordPress, you know, so these stories will will definitely continue to live on. So I'm really excited about the prospects for Campfire Stories Volume Three, and <laughs> I, I really look forward to to seeing that. And I hope that when that day comes, you will come back and visit with us again. Of course, yeah, we'd be happy to. Awesome, guys. Just in the interest of of um, everyone's time, I'm like to make sure that um, we are aware of, of upcoming titles um, on the Joy Chip Reading Project. Our next book coming up next month is um, Kosher Soul by Michael Twitty, um, an amazing book about the culinary traditions of the uh, Jewish and African-American community. And coming up later this summer, Ola Ranger, um, the story of David Vela, the first uh, Latino director of the National Park Service. Again, I want to thank my guests today, uh, Dave and Alyssa Q. 
And more importantly as well, I want to make sure that everyone goes out and reads their fabulous book, Campfire Stories 2. Um, also, I want to make sure that we know that author discussions of the Joy Ship Reading Project are made possible thanks to the support of the Schleck Family Foundation, the National Geographic Society, and the National Park Service in partnership with Together Outdoors and the University of Wisconsin-Madison Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. I hope that you'll join us again on our next um, expedition through literature. And until then, take care and have a great week. And we'll look forward to talking again next time. Good night, everyone.